you again this month. It uh, seems that these months get close together sometimes when you are busy, at least as busy as uh, I've been. And uh, as far as uh, preaching is concerned, because it seems like I've preached every day for the last two months. But um, anyway, we're back again to share with you a message that is upon my heart. Now, the particular message that I'm going to share with you this month is a message about praying for uh, the lost as well as praying against the devil about some activities that's going on that's foreign, foreign to the Christian life. A lot of the preparation has come as a result of an invitation to write a short article on praying for the lost and also out of the experience of being asked to come and share with a Christian group in Atlanta, Georgia on how the devil fights, uh, you know, uh, the ministry. So I want to give you two, two st stories and then we're going to preach to these two issues. Number one is here you have a loved one or a lost friend that you're concerned about and um, it seems that they do not come to the Lord by just you telling them the story of Jesus and his love and showing them that uh, he really died to take care of their sins. And so now, what do you do? So what do you do with this uh, situation? The other issue is this. Here is a ministry. Obviously, the ministry was originated with God. The people have uh, gotten way out in the ministry to the degree of having 12 staff members. And all at once, after a couple of years of the funds being supernaturally provided, the funds stopped coming in. And yet at the very same time, uh, the ministry is being blessed by the fact that it's reaching more people and God is supernaturally acting on their behalf. What's wrong? So now they're at the door of death if something doesn't happen. So now we're going to be talking to these two issues in this tape. Now just let me say a few things in a personal way and we're going to come back of course to the uh, two uh, situations. Number one is uh, while the fact by the time you get this tape uh, the Lord willing Martha and I uh, will have the privilege of fellowshipping with our first grandson only grandson our only grandchild uh, our son, Manley Jr., and his wife, and their son, Manley Christopher, will be arriving uh, in the um, Dallas-Fort Worth area to spend some time with us. In fact, it looks, it seems that uh, Manley Jr. feels that uh, the Lord uh, wants him to come back from Anchorage, Alaska, and enter into school again and do some work that that you know we feel that the Lord intended for him to do all along uh, we um, felt when he went to Anchorage Alaska a couple of years back that he would be up there about two years and uh, that's being cut short just a little bit by a couple of months but not too much but nevertheless we did feel all along that he would come back and go to school so um, we're all excited about their returning, and uh, I trust that you'll pray for them, that you'll pray for 
Martha and I that we'll not get so excited over that grandbaby that we'll just ruin him. But anyway, we're excited about this reunion, this blessed opportunity of, of uh, sharing our life uh, with this grandson. Well, uh, the Lord is doing so much through the summer. Uh, it's been extremely busy and extremely hot. I'm sure it's been very hot around where you live. It has certainly been hot in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But uh, the Lord is blessed, given a, a great deal of direction uh, this summer. In fact, uh, as I am sharing this message with you on tape, I have uh, been renewed in the Lord over God's future plan for my own life. Uh, many of you have been uh, keeping up with the building progress or the progress in the building program of the building in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And related to that particular program, uh, Wendell Goodman and his family have moved into the Dallas-Fort Worth area or are in the direct process of moving into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And... Uh, Plans are going on, slowly but surely. But in the midst of all this, the Lord has really begun to speak to my heart and renew my vision and strengthen my vision about His plans for my life on down the road. And it's so exciting because the Lord, many years ago, came to me by the Spirit of God just speaking to my heart and just simply ask me if uh, I wanted to have a part in the revival that he would send to this country. And so uh, I surrendered to that. Went home and told Marthy. I said, uh, God's really dealt with my heart about revival in this country. And asked me if I wanted to go along. And said... I told her, I said, I've agreed with him. And said, what do you think? And she agreed that she wanted to go along. And she realized that, boy, she'd be giving up a great deal of my life. And so uh, the Lord started a process right then. I had to take each member of my family uh, to the door of death. And I had to give them up. And I did this. And then years later, the Lord began to give them back to me. But each one of our family had to be brought to the door of death as far as I was concerned. And I died not only to my family, but I died to the, everything I, uh, that was an issue with me. And so um, uh, I, I was given a real vision and not only a vision, but a burden. And not only a burden, but faith. To believe that God would do a mighty, mighty, mighty work in this country. A work that would um, involve three areas of uh, expression. Number one, that he would save people and give them new life in Christ Jesus. Number two, that he would really instill in them the character of Jesus, which is actually the fullness of the Spirit of God in the believer. And number three, that he would uh, teach these spiritual Christians how to be reproductive, how to win people to Jesus Christ. God really put this on me. And uh, I was able to believe God that this would happen in the meetings and across this country. And uh, in my lifetime, I, I have seen God do a great deal in bringing this to pass. But uh, right here, in these last few weeks, 
I've seen God begin to renew that because uh, I, I've had the opportunity um, to back off of it. Of course, there's always been the opportunity of backing off such a challenge, but uh, but uh, I've had a subtle temptation, very uh, unique type of temptation. But the Lord has renewed this vision. And I I can almost say he's renewed it in the last 12 hours because um, the temptation has become so severe this week and so obvious this weekend that that this has really, really, really quickened my life and and my life. And so I'm just excited about, uh, about the... The renewing of this vision. Well, if I'm not careful, I get carried away in sharing this uh, with you. But uh, this has really been a great deal to me. Uh, one of the sweet things that's happened also this uh, week, past week especially, uh, has been, the, or in particular, the uh, youngest son. John has come to a real genuine understanding that he really knows the Lord. And this Wednesday night, which of course will be a couple of weeks after um, or before you get this tape, uh, I'll get to baptize John. And it seems our whole family will be able to witness this baptizing. In our church in Eunice, Texas, one a member of a, of a family is baptized, the whole family gets to stand behind the baptistry and witness this uh, baptizing. So this will be quite an experience because for the first time in years, uh, all the Beasley, mainly Beasley family, will be together. And it will be at church uh, with John's baptism. And so it's, it's just a beautiful experience. I want you to pray that God will teach us how to be capable of walking with Him in the Spirit. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you took notice of the last month's tape, but uh, as I said, uh, those particular principles that were brought out in this particular tape were principles that were so basic. And it's not that I have had not through the years preached along this line. I had, but never had I pronounced these three distinct principles. And uh, so I'm really uh, excited about the result of the people that we're getting from people that's um, really listening to that particular tape. So you, you just pray that God's richest blessings will be upon the the people as they are making some adjustments in their life in relationship to that tape. And, of course, there are some questions, there are some exceptions, and so uh, we're beginning to get some of those questions, and we're being able to point out some of those objections and so on. Now, I could go on and on just talking with you about uh, the different things that are happening in relationship to the ministry this hour. But uh, I want, I just want you to stay up with us, keep on praying for us in relationship to this building. And uh, and just, uh, just keep me in your prayers that God will keep me as healthy as he wants me to be. Uh, oh, I did, uh, might ought to mention this to you. Many of you are concerned about this. Many of you aren't. But uh, I was back to the doctor about two weeks ago for a regular six-month checkup, and he just said, Well, Manly, uh, it seems that things are fairly stable in your life. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, You just call me and let me know when you want to come back and see me again. In other words, no longer any six-month checkups. He said, 
you just let me know when you want to come back. It was a beautiful time because the doctor and I just sat down and talked for about an hour. And he told me one time during my uh, stay in the hospital that they backed off and said, well, if he lives 30 days, then we'll see. And when I walked in alive, 30, 60, 90, <laughs> he said he, they were shook. They couldn't understand it. A man with malignant hypertension usually never lives very long. And there I was doing, what, doing better, continuing to get better. And I'm continuing to get better even this hour, as far as we can tell. And just unreal, beautiful, blessed experience to be with that doctor for an hour, talking about things that I knew very little about, he knew a great deal about, and yet letting him show me how God had worked miraculously in my life. Well, praise the Lord for all that. I could just reminisce and talk and fellowship with you all day on this phone. Uh, Excuse me, not a phone on tape recording. I'm I'm here in my room in Houston, Texas, speaking to the First Baptist Church of Bel Air, Texas, just this weekend, and um, so I'm using a a, a tape recorder that I take with me, and I, I'm trusting that this will really do the job. And so I I'm being seated and talking, and I'm up walking and talking and so um, in the background the air conditioner comes on occasionally so you'll excuse the noise but I, I believe this personal touch you appreciate a great deal more and so I, I will accept the noise to have the opportunity just to personally fellowship you with you. And by the way as you get this tape there's a number of preachers on this ministry and um we're excited about the many, many preachers that are uh, getting these tapes. We do, I just trust that God will minister to you. Uh, more, God is doing some things across this country. And I trust that you personally are getting in on what God is doing. Now, to the message. Well, we're back to our thoughts concerning praying for the lost. And as we look at this particular subject matter, uh, I believe that we have two issues that face us here in this uh, title. One issue is prayer, and the other issue is the lost. And for simplicity's sake and understanding on my part and your part, I want us to deal with uh, this question first, what is prayer? And... uh, as we deal with the subject of what is prayer, uh, you know, I find it really difficult to give a real definition of prayer. I know that I have several hundred books that give very various definitions concerning prayer, but uh, I just want to give you some that I believe that will be applicable to us in this particular situation and that will relate to this particular message. You know, prayer, uh, it concerns talking with God, it concerns talking with man, and it even concerns talking with the devil. Now, you may uh, question that last statement, but if you take a careful look at Mark 11, 22 through 24, you will find that the Lord tells us something here of our confession concerning satanic opposition and so on. So as we look into this matter of prayer, I feel like that prayer is communion, but yet it's it's a great deal more than that. That's not enough. Uh, that doesn't say it all. Uh, prayer goes beyond that. Uh, you can say that prayer is confession. And when you talk about confession, what are you saying? Most people believe that basically that confession is saying what God says about a given matter. And when we talk about confession, we're talking about, uh, you know, saying to God what we believe he says about things in us. Uh, For instance, if we've sinned against God, uh, we need to say what God says about that sin. Confession certainly is a type of prayer. 
And by the way, we never get uh, so spiritually mature that we get away from this matter of confession. We have to always confess. We need to confess that we've sinned against God and sinned against man. And so um, there's confession. But this does not say at all. Uh, beyond confession is partition. And we always will be privileged and also requested to petition God. And when we come to defining the matter of petition or the prayer of petition, the matter of petitioning God, we are talking about asking or requesting. This very likely comes out of a need that surrounds us in some way. Then there's another type of prayer. This matter of petitioning God does not say at all. There is a matter of praise or adoration or thanksgiving, which is all the same. And, of course, this uh, comes out of the concept of uh, us recognizing God for who He is and what He's doing and our relationship into this particular uh, situation. And then after petition, a praise, and by the way, praise, adoration does not say it all. Here comes intercession. And when we get to intercession, of course, we're uh, dealing with a type of prayer that uh, uh, very few people seemingly know anything about. And I certainly do not uh, say uh, that I know much about intercession. But I know as we look into the matter of intercession or a definition of intercession, I, I find that we need to break it down a little bit. I believe that intercession means recognition. I believe that uh, this recognition definitely uh, means that we see that there is a need and a need for a position to be taken. And thereby we feel responsible at this point. And then I think after recognition comes identification. And what I believe this identification means that we uh, become identified with the situation that we have just recognized. And this identification means taking on the responsibility of um, meeting the need that we have just discovered in this particular recognition. And then after identification comes what I believe I would call participation. Now out of that particip participation may mean sacrifice. But definitely out of that participation, it means that you have taken on the responsibility of seeing the need met at all costs to you. Now, Jesus Christ was a great intercessor. There's no question about he recognized our need. He identified himself with our need. And he participated in all that was necessary to meet uh, with the Father, that is, against the devil, to meet our need. Now, I think this is a, a beautiful illustration of an intercessor. Then I think there's another illustration that would identify intercession. Uh, George Mueller. It may be that you know of him, or it may be that you do not know of him. If uh, you know of him, you know that he was the uh, director of an orphanage. And he got into the position of intercession in relationship to that orphanage. It's such a beautiful story. You need to read his life story if you haven't. And there's the story is told that there would be times as he as he would trust the Lord for 
the needs to be met for that orphanage, they would not be met. That he would go out and sell his furniture in order to meet the needs of those kids. Now, that's the experience of an intercessor. An intercessor uh, does not count the cost. He uh, sees the need. He identifies himself with that need. And he participates in this involvement at any cost. He does not count the cost to him. You see that constantly, of course, in the life of the Lord Jesus. I, I read something on prayer one time, and I think it's probably the, one of the greatest things I've ever read on prayer or heard on prayer. And that was this. Never pray a prayer unless you're willing to be the means by which that prayer is answered. Now, that's intercession. That's intercession. Now, we'll go from intercession to what I call the spoken word of faith or the confession of faith or the prayer of faith. Different people call this uh, level of prayer uh, different things, but nevertheless, I, I just usually say it's a spoken word of faith. And what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about a person seeing a thing as God sees it and uh, going through whatever it takes to get into the position to see a thing as God sees it and then just verbalizing what God says. Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. Now, this is brought out beautifully in Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. And so we have the um, matter of prayer before us. And I'm certainly not uh, indicating to you that concerning this matter of prayer, I've said everything there is to be said. Well, there's a lot more to be said. But I do find that this matter of prayer is graduated into one level into another, one level into another. And it may be wise just to say this right here at this point, that uh, there are times when one kind of prayer will work, when another kind of prayer has failed. And um, it may be that uh, there are times when one kind of prayer will not be needed that you have used in another occasion. Uh, I, I've seen this happen so beautifully. Uh, I've asked God to do something, and he's done it. And at another time, I've asked him to do something, and he didn't do it. But I'd praise him for it, and he'd do it. Uh, I've seen other times when um, I would uh, ask God for something, and he didn't do it. And then I would have to get in the position of faith and actually declare that it's done and it would be done and there's other times that I've just simply confessed my sins to the Lord got my heart right with God and immediately things would be done now, I think this is something that's going on across our country today I, I think people are, are not dividing up these different levels of prayer and so many people think, well, if I just get right with God, then God will automatically do things. And uh, I believe there's error at this point. So I trust that this little area right here will help you in this matter of praying for the lost. Now, as we go further into this, we're going to leave this concept of prayer for just a moment and talk about uh, the lost so I want to ask you this question. What is the lost person? What is he? Or you might say, who is he? Uh, well, let me just say this. He's a person. And in the fact that he's a person, that means something. That he's got a body, he's got a soul, and he has a spirit. And uh, with man having a body, a soul, and a spirit... Uh, that's saying a great deal. You can uh, contact him physically. You can contact him intellectually. You can contact him emotionally. And you can reason with him. And you can challenge him to make choices. And he can make choices on the basis 
of his intellect, the basis of his uh, emotion, and this choice is made from the basis of his will. I realize that when we're talking about a man, uh, some people say, well, man is not a trichotomy. He's a dichotomy. That he's not body, soul, and spirit. He's just body and soul. And I realize with a lot of the people across the world that this is just a matter of semantics. It's not a matter of deep significance at all. Very likely that many do not even know what they're talking about. I think to serious theologians back in the back, ground way back, I think this is a, a very serious matter. It's a serious matter because if you have man technically as a dichotomist, just body and soul, you have a man with the ability to come with, to God without the work of the Spirit. Now, I realize that uh, I'm throwing some statements out here that uh, will send some preachers to thinking and praying, and this is exactly the reason I'm saying it. I know of some dichotomies today that would uh, simply refer to this as ridiculous. They'd say, well, no man can just come to God on his own. And um, therefore, God has to be there. And what I'm saying is, if we could move back into the realm of history and see where the dichotomous concept came into being, uh, I think we would find that, uh, that at that time this was a very serious point of error. And it has given way to the mass movement of easy believism in our day. Yet I'm a firm believer in the matter of the fact that the uh, man is body, soul, and spirit. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, it says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, there are many, 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 many more verses that deal with this matter of uh, body, soul, and spirit. And I realize that, you know, a lot of people go back to the uh, matter of the text, you know, and they'll get into the Greek and say this and that and the other. But um, my own personal conviction is that the Bible teaches that a man is definitely a body, soul, and spirit. And in the notes on this particular message, I want to give you many, many verses that will deal with this particular area. Now, we come to the place, as we're talking about man now, and we're talking about the fact that he's a, a being and that he has a body and a soul and a spirit. We want to talk about his spirit for just a moment. For in Ephesians 2.1, the Bible says that a man is dead in trespasses and sin. And I, I believe this uh, would indicate man is incapable to come to God without the work of God upon him. Now, I believe that the Bible is uh, so, dis so definite at this point. I realize that there's more involved here than I'm being able to say, but uh, when you have a man that's dead in trespasses and sin, Man cannot do the work of resurrecting that man. God has to do the work of resurrecting that man. Now, I feel that we come now to the question, and the question is this. So, what now what can man do to relate to a lost man? What can he do for it? All right, I believe he can do three things. I believe that he can uh, preach the Word of God to it. The Bible says that men are saved through the preaching of the Word of God. I believe that he can pray. And the Bible is clear in teaching that we are to pray one for another. 
then I believe he can give influence. Uh, make it possible for others to preach. I believe he can do these three things. So by our choice, we have uh, come to this thing of praying for the lost. And so we're going to talk about praying for the lost. Some people might just simply ask the question, well, what? why pray for the lost? Well, there's a couple of things I've never understood about God. <laughs> and I feel like there uh, may be a couple of things you haven't understood about God. And, of course, I'm saying that in a joking way. There's a many, 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 many things that I haven't understood about God. There's just many, many things that I haven't understood about him at all. And um, one of the things I haven't understood about God is this matter of prayer. I just haven't figured out all that there is about the uh, matter of praying. But yet God in his economy teaches us through his word to pray. And he's actually given us 6,000 years of history of how men have prayed and God has worked. And I believe with the fact that God has commanded us to pray. And he's given us one story after another for 6,000 years of how men have prayed and God has worked. I believe that within itself is enough to satisfy me at least to the fact that we ought to pray. I believe it goes beyond that. I believe it says more than the fact that we ought to pray. I believe it even says somewhat as to how we ought to pray. And the fact that if we do not pray, the job will not get done. So I feel that um, praying is one thing that influences the three realms that must be touched to bring men to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what three realms are you talking about? Man, God, and Satan. I believe that uh, when a man prays, and I'm talking about uh, not just verbalizing words, but uh, man really prays, he's in contact with God, I believe there are three areas that are affected. Uh, man, Satan, and God. And I just uh, believe that uh, when we adequately pray, somehow, some way, God deals with the lost people. And I believe this dealing on the part of God with lost people is necessary. Just as I believe is presenting the word of God to lost people is necessary. And I believe that when men do not pray, there are many that people do not get saved. Now, I'm not saying that a person could not get saved without uh, people petitioning God. But I am saying that I do not believe people can get saved without people praying. And when I say 
without people praying. I'm taking in the scope of prayer from the point of confession all the way through to the point of spoken word of faith. I believe in this spectrum of prayer there's one kind or another of prayer needed for the salvation of lost souls. That's right. You might say, well, I disagree. And to most of the people that's on this tape ministry, I doubt seriously if you're disagreeing. It may be that I'm not making myself clear. And I just want to take one more moment or two and deal with this matter of doing my best to make it clear. Um, Let's take that matter of intercession. The intercessor is a man that sees the lost, identifies himself with the need, and pays the price to see the job done. Now, this is not necessarily prayer on the level of petitioning, but it is including petitioning. This is not necessarily prayer on the level of confession, but it is including that of confession. It is not necessarily that of uh, praise, but it is including that. It is not necessarily the spoken word of faith, but it is including that. In other words, see, the intercessor is a person that is paying whatever price that's necessary to bring the lost to Jesus. And somehow we just get the idea that intercession is getting in your closet and getting on your knees and staying there X number of hours for the next job, so and so. But that's not the case. An intercessor may not get on his knees. He may be out on the job. He may be on his knees. He is doing whatever is necessary to reach that man for Christ. So I say that I do not believe that people get saved without prayer. And so I trust that somehow, some way, God will teach us to pray. And what I mean by prayer is more in my heart than in my head. And I trust that some way, somehow, God will teach us to pray. I would love to give you an illustration just for a point of inspiration to you. Back about a year and a half, two years ago, I visited Jackson, Mississippi for a meeting. In the church where I was preaching, there happened to be a man that I was reared with when I was just a tiny boy, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven years old. This boy and I had not seen each other in 35 years. And uh, so we decided to get together one day, and we made it early in the morning so we could spend a good number of hours together. And we had our breakfast, and we had a sweet time reminiscing about how we used to go down the creek, go swimming, go through my uncle's watermelon patch and pick up a watermelon, cool it in the creek, eat it without permission, of course, we confessed that, you know, and got it straight. Uh, and I really did to that uncle, by the way. Um, and we talked about the time we would go hunting. And, oh, my, it was, a, it was a sweet time of fellowship. Now, this man gave me his testimony and only been saved nine months. And he is out of a family of ten people, ten, ten brothers and sisters. Wow, I mean, it's just something else. And and uh, he is the only one that's saved by the grace of God. So he shared with me about how he lived an alcoholic life, or life of an alcoholic, and how he was not saved, and how Jesus came into his heart about nine months previous to our time together. And... Um, and so all at once he just stopped that and seemed, I thought he changed the subject, but he didn't. He just picked it up in another direction. Uh, he said to me, he said, you know, Manley said, 
We talked about the great times and how I enjoyed your fellowship and you enjoyed mine. But he said, you know, there was something about our fellowship in those days I did not enjoy. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine. He said, and that was coming home with you and spending the night. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, it almost insulted me, but I've learned to hear people through. I trust you have. And um, so I said, uh, I don't understand. He said, well, you know, we'd go to your house to spend the night, and your mother would always make us clean up, feed us well. I remember those times. and My mother had one of the cleanest houses in town, and she was one of the best cooks. So, um, And so I just couldn't understand why I didn't enjoy all that. And he said, you know, then she'd put us to bed after a while. And uh, he said, then that's when the trouble would start. He said, you'd fall off to sleep, but said, I'd hear your mother praying. And said she'd be praying for me, praying that the Spirit of God would get hold of my heart and save me. And he said, all these years, all these years, I've heard, I've listened to your mother pray. And he said, as far as I know, outside of a grandmother and granddad, she's the only person that ever prayed for me. And said, when I got saved by the grace of God nine months ago, he said, I knew your mother was getting her prayers answered. <laughs> I, I went home and told my mother about this story. And she said, well, you know, I, I just knew it was my responsibility to pray. But said, I had no idea, you know, that about uh, how significant those prayers really were. But there she stood weeping. And she'd gotten in on some of the eternal activity of God by simply praying over a boy that came to spend the night with her son. Well, let me encourage you to pray. You may not even understand it. And you notice in this particular uh, message, I haven't tried to define it to the extent of the ramifications as to why you should pray and all that. But I trust in some way some way, somehow, you'll realize that when we pray, God moves, man moves, Satan moves. Let me encourage you to pray. Well, we want to come now to the uh, other story about the young man and his ministry that's facing... Uh, uh, time that I feel is very, very critical in his uh, whole life. He, um, of course, uh, saved a number of years ago, got a real burden and a vision, and began to put this organization together. And it seems that God has blessed all along in a very consistent way he has uh, blessed him in providing finances up to this point, and he's also blessed him with putting together a fantastic staff, and he's blessed him in putting together a fantastic opportunity. His opportunity will preach to not millions this year, but billions of people. Now, I didn't say millions, I said billions. And... Um, all at once, within the last month, everything begins to fall apart. I mean, financially. Uh, in fact, I want to make that very distinct. It's just in the financial area that things are falling apart. In the uh, area of opportunity, there's one miracle after another. And in the area of... Uh, Productivity on the part of the staff, there is one blessing after another. So um, I want to bring this out because this is very important. And I, I know that we must see this. We just, as God's children, we must see that uh, when there is a problem on one hand and a blessing on the other hand within the same context, we need to realize that this is saying something very, very, very distinct to us. Now, if you're living in sin, 
there is not going to be any of the blessings of the Lord at all in um, the ministry at all. But if God is saying something more, that there's not sin, but there is correction, there's enlargement uh, in your life, then you, you're going to have to realize that there will be the uh, blessings and the uh, almost the cursings at the same identical time. Now this, this can give us a great deal of direction. This also can give us a great deal of comfort at this point. So now how are we going to deal with this young man? He's faced with the uh, fact of having to get out of the ministry. Now, let me just complicate the matter a little more by telling you the, a little more about the facts. Uh, now, this young man does not have a ministry whereby through his ministry he can appeal to people for funds. Okay? Um... Now, this young man can handle his problem in the way of the flesh, or he can handle it in the way of the Spirit. Now, there's no question about this fact that God can uh, do anything he wants to do. But you know as well as I know that God follows basic laws. Now, how in the world can this young man handle his problem? Well, I believe the first thing he should do is uh, ask the Lord to show him what's wrong with himself. Then ask the Lord to show him anything that might be wrong in his staff. And I think this will cause each one of them to put a check on not only their character, but the method of which they work. And I believe all corrections should be made. Then, after all corrections are made by confession, restitution, claiming of the blood of Jesus Christ on their sins, then they should uh, do another thing. They should, what I am going to call this, positionalize themselves. You say, what does that mean? That means to establish their position in Christ. Now, assuming that by them getting right with the Lord did not release the finances they needed. So they must go further. And by the way, I may just stop here. If it's just correction that a person needs when they are facing a financial difficulty. The moment they make that correction, very likely the money will come on through. But now let's say that they made the corrections, the money is not coming through, well, they, do, they positionalize themselves. All right, let's see what we're talking about about positionalizing themselves. Let's see, one is this. As far as God's provision about finances, Anything that he starts, anything that he's in, anything that he is uh, doing, he has already made full provision. Second Peter 1, 3. And check that out. Now they need to settle this. Second thing, that uh, positionalize themselves mean that they are rechecking the fact that God initiated this and they are now actively trusting the Lord to bring about the needed funds. All right. They've got themselves in the position of faith on this issue. All right. We're going on a little further. Then, they need to claim the fullness of the Spirit of the Lord in themselves that they might be strengthened in the Spirit of the Lord, according to Ephesians 6, 10. And uh, then they also need to put on the armor of God, according to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And then 
they need to go a little further and uh, ask the Lord to give them some definite word from Him whereby they might be able to cooperate with God in the strategy of, uh, of the Lord. And I believe right here is um, where we're going to miss it if we aren't careful. Because here again, it may not take any more than just a uh, petition. It may not take any more than just a praise. It may not take any more than just a spoken word of faith. It may not take any more than intercession. Now, for me to say it may not take any more, I do not mean that any one of these expressions can be lightly taken. But the child of God has got to be sensitive to God to know which one is necessary. As I said earlier in this tape, one time, one use, uh, one uh, type of prayer is used and the next time another. And so the child of God must be sensitive to cooperate with God in this given situation. A lot of people have the idea today that, boy, we can just leave it to God. And leaving it to God, as I've said in earlier tapes, does not mean that you throw up your hands and just give it to Him. It means you throw up your hands and let Him have you where He can work through you to accomplish His goal. So, um, this, this man's uh, problem, how's it going to be solved? I think it will be solved by this man getting into the presence of God, meaning cleaning up every area that's necessary for him to get in the presence of God. And then as he gets into the presence of God, God will show him exactly which way to go to accomplish his end. I'm talking about God's end. And um, this man's activity may look to you as you look on from the world as fleshly as the man that's working in the flesh. But the difference will be simply this that he will be motivated from the Lord that is working in him mightily. He will be inspired by the Lord that's working for him mightily. And he will be directed by the Lord that's working through him mightily. That's right. Now, you say, what do you mean? I've been in meetings in my life when I have had a need of uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I've asked the Lord for it just simply as just asking for it and he's given it I've been in other meetings where I've had needs and the only way that I could see the finances released was to tell the devil that my father in heaven had provided all that I needed and that he was a defeated foe and I was standing and letting him know that he had no right on God's provision for his child. And man, the Lord would just be able to bring this right through. I've seen other times when uh, I have been in need 
and I have just had to put my life and all that God had given me up to that point on the uh, altar and say, all right, I'll sell this in order to meet these needs. And I've had to do it. The position of an intercessor. And I've seen God come through then in a miraculous way. Or do you say, did you get along without selling the item? No, I sold it. But in that I did, later on, God uh, did a mighty work. Now let me just say this about this matter of an uh, intercessor. Few people ever get in the position of an intercessor. I have uh, placed the position of an intercessor in a um, place between adoration and the spoken word of faith. And I'm not sure that's where it belongs. Regardless of where it belongs, I trust the Lord will richly bless you through this tape.